Good morning. It is 10 a.m. on November 3rd, 2021, and it is time for the Fall Partner Workshop. Welcome and thank you for joining us. We are so glad you are all here. Today, we got an exciting lineup. It's, we're going to start off uh, with myself, Andy Brown. I'm the Warning Coordination Meteorologist at the National Weather Service in Spokane, Washington. I'm going to start off by reviewing some of the messaging strategies. Uh, then Robin Fox is going to take over. Actually, uh, we mixed that up a little bit. Uh, Char, Charlotte Dewey is going to talk about uh, some review of some recent high impact events. Uh, give it back to me to go over some updates to our products and services. Take a short break around 11 a.m. and then the after, afternoon session, no, the after 11 a.m. session uh, will be the Robin Fox show. Uh, she's going to go through some fire season and burn scar statistics from this past year, uh, review the spotter training that we're providing, and then go into the seasonal outlook at the end. So that is our rough agenda. I don't know that it will take the full two hours, but uh, we scheduled this just in case. So uh, we have over 50 people in attendance. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day. Uh, we know you are all very busy and uh, we don't want to... Uh, waste your time. So we're going to jump right into it and um, we'll have some polling questions to be interactive and uh, hopefully you'll learn something new today. So there's a, an older picture of me fishing up in Alaska in my happy days. Uh, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about some briefing strategies. I think you've seen some of these slides, the folks that joined us in the spring, uh, you might recognize some of these slides, but I, I do have some new information for you as well. First, why are we here? I'd like to go over this quote because it really solidifies the purpose of the Weather Service talking to our partners at uh, workshops like this and building relationships. And it's because forecasts by themselves, they don't possess any intrinsic value. The whole purpose of us providing forecasts to you is to influence the decisions that you are making. So a perfect forecast is useless if you don't understand and can take appropriate action with that forecast. So that's the purpose. That's why we are here today is to help sure that make or help make sure that you understand what information that we are providing so that you can take appropriate action when those weather hazards are coming. So that's why we're here today. I hope that makes a lot of sense. Um, and so I'm just going to jump right into it. Last year, or in the spring, I, sh I made up this bar graph to show the last, I think it was the six months of the different five-tier colored system, these impact uh, different levels that we use to message impact levels for weather events. And so I updated that here recently for the entire year. So this is looking from November 1st of 2020 all the way through October 31st of this year. And it kind of breaks down how we have messaged each little weather event that has impacted the inland northwest. And again, our area of responsibility is from the Cascade Crest down to Lewiston um, and then up into the Idaho Panhandle. So it's a large area of responsibility. Some of you are in the Spokane or Lewiston area or over in Wenatchee. So we try to hit all of that. So it doesn't mean that every color you see here was impacting Bonners Ferry or Moses Lake, but somewhere in our area, we were messaging uh, th these impact levels. So this is how the year broke down. And so we're gonna jump right into the first poll question. Let me remember how to get this out. So we're gonna do the five tier impact and launch poll. And hopefully you can see that five tier levels are intended to assist our partners to make decisions based on potential threats. So this, this is the five colors that I'm talking about. So select one of these three. I understand these five tiers, it adds value. I glance at it, but uh, not fully understand it, or you do not use them at all, or it doesn't add any value. Getting results in. And I believe I can share the results. I'm clicking around, make sure I can 
I can do this. Okay, collecting responses, we'll call it in three, two, one. We're gonna close that poll. And I share it. Sorry for the awkward silence. Clicking around to see what you guys see. Oh, you can see it, okay. So there's the responses right there. So we have four more questions. Hopefully I will not be as awkward in those next four. But those are the responses right there. Great. We asked these same questions last time. And so I, we had a baseline. And so what's very helpful is to go back and ask similar questions so we can see how our messaging has changed and how that's affected our users. Are we doing a good job of conveying the message? Are you understanding that? Or do we need to tweak that? So why that, that's why most of you that have been on these before have seen these questions. Uh, but it still adds a lot of value for us to be able to see and hear um, any changes. All right. So I can now hide that and go back to the presentation. Audience view, yes. So let's go over real fast. And I have some new uh, examples of what these mean. When I broke down those 365 days, that bar graph that you see at the top, the green or the no impacts expected. Uh, or little to no impacts expected, comes out to about 58% of the days are green days. And that's your common weather, sunny skies, patchy fog, not much is going on, uh, just benign, pleasant weather. If we go to the minor impacts or the yellow, these are used for common weather events uh, or events that happen very frequently. Um, examples I have on there, some snow showers or light snow, patchy dense fog, mountain snow that only affects the, the, the passes maybe, um, breezy or windy conditions, or localized stream flooding due to um, rises on those streams from rain on melting snow. So these are kind of common events and what how it broke down was 26% of the time over the last year, we used that minor impacts. So frequent events, not as many as the green, but frequent, about 25 or a quarter of the time. Now let's get into the moderate impacts. The examples I put for here are locally heavy snow. We have freezing rain, uh, windy or power outages, so a windstorm, uh, and flooding is possible. So these are the winter impacts that we're looking at. And that's just some a few examples of what you might expect for moderate impacts. And over the last year, we used that 13% of the time. So less frequently. Now let's get into the major impacts. So these are widespread heavy snow events, uh, a windstorm with uh, damage and power outages, major flooding, an ice storm caused by, uh, that causes power outages or travel impacts. So these are the major events we only highlighted 2% of the time over the last year, major impacts. And if you look at this bar graph, I think Shar is gonna talk about that. One was in January, and then the other time was in late June and early July with the heat wave. And these pictures you see here, this one in the bottom right, I believe that's the St. Mary's uh, flood from 1996. So we would definitely consider that a very high or major impact. And then the only thing above that is the extreme impact, the exceptionally rare weather events. Uh, and with these events, this is when it comes down to a high impact and high confidence. So now we're saying that a high impact event is likely to happen. And that's when we'll ramp that messaging up into that extreme impacts level, uh, widespread wind damage and power outages, extreme winter weather with heavy snow and or freezing rain, of uh, extreme flooding. And a lot of times when it comes to these extreme impacts, it's a cumulative effect. So that means that we're talking about a snowstorm after a snowstorm after a snowstorm. After a week of heavy snow, that cumulative effect could have a crippling effect on uh, infrastructure, uh, power infrastructure, travel, all of that. So sometimes these extreme impacts are based on that cumulative effect like a flooding event where you get rain and rain and rain, storm after storm, and eventually that, that gets into the river system, and then you have this rising of the rivers and extreme flooding. 
So that just kind of goes into a review of the five different tiered impact levels and how we use that, how we are going to use that winter to message potential threats. So we're gonna have some more questions coming up here. So the first one, I wanna talk about our briefing strategy. The best way to stay informed routinely is through our website, weather.gov slash Spokane. Uh, on your mobile device, you can go to mobile.weather.gov. We are active on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, we upload uh, briefings to YouTube as well. And then the most common way that we will let you know what's going on is our weekly weather briefing. We send that every Monday morning, first thing in the morning. And in the fall and in the spring, uh, when I asked this question before, about 90% of the people said that these still add value and meet their needs uh, so the next poll question that I'm going to launch right now. So we're going to go to two, question two and launch poll. Regarding these weekly weather briefings, do they still add value to your operations? So we kind of have a baseline of what you shared last time, and we just want to compare and make sure that we are still adding value and you do or don't want to, us to make any changes. Another five seconds to get your answers in. Three, two, one. We'll close the poll and we will share the poll. All right, there's your results. Just upon initial glance, I believe that is very similar to what we've seen before. Uh, we have about 60 people on here and 85% voted. So that's about, that's about what we would expect. So great. Thank you for sharing that information. And then let's go back to the presentation. See, I'm getting better at this. Oh, I forgot this last part was uh, I talked about every Monday morning, we send this out and it's going to be an overview of the potential weather hazards for the next seven days and sometimes beyond. So outside of our weekly briefings, we will send out partner emails. And these are one page emails uh, that can be saved or sent in a PDF format. And we send these, uh, the, the strategy that we take is we consider sending these partner emails anytime a watch warning or advisory is in effect, or we see that potential coming up, or if the weather is the potential impacts differ from the previous email that we sent out. And that could be changes in our confidence or the impact level. So if we send out the Monday briefing and it comes around to Wednesday or Thursday, and we see that the next storm system is gonna be uh, more impactful, or we have a higher degree of confidence of something happening, then we'll send out an update. And so with that, over the last year, I went back and I counted every one of them. And we sent out 206 emailed weather briefings uh, that, and that breaks down to the 52 weekly briefings plus the 154 partner emails that go out between what, Tuesday and Sunday. So for our partners, you all, you received an email from the weather service 56% of the days over the last year with some sort of briefing, if you've signed up for to be on our list. So kind of look at that graph up there about the weather impacts that you saw and think about that, the, the Monday briefings plus the 154, 56% of the days, think about how all that, uh, if you read them, if that was useful to you. And then we're gonna go to this next poll question. And, my favorite thing in the world, we're gonna Goldilocks it. We sent out 56% of the days, we sent out a weather briefing on 56% of the days. Was it too many? Was it just right? Or do you want more? 50% voted. Huh? 70%, all right. Five seconds. And this looks consistent with what I remember. Three, two, one, close and share. Look at that. 
So that, I believe, is consistent with the last time we asked this question. So that is excellent feedback. Thank you very much. And then we hide this and we go back to the presentation. And now the timing. The timing of these briefings, there's a wide variety of reasons of when we send out these weather briefings. And so this graph that I created shows the time of day from left to right. That's midnight on the far left and 11 p.m. on the far right. The majority of the briefing emails that we send out are first thing in the morning between 5 and, say, 9 a.m. And so what I looked at was I added all these up, and 46% of the time we're sending it, about half the time we're sending it before 9 a.m. And then it spreads out uh, for the rest of the day. We've sent anywhere from 5 to 17 or so briefings between 10 a.m and the end of the day. So this next poll question, think about your operations and receiving these emails. What is the perfect time of day to receive these? So let's go to the second to last picture. Oops, I did the wrong one, sorry. And launch. The weather forecast warrants an update to the partner email from the weather service. What time would you like to receive these? First thing in the morning by 8 a.m., by start of business, by sometime in the morning, or noon, by the end of the workday, or it doesn't matter, just send it when you get a chance. Yeah, 60% have voted, 70%. This is such a great way to keep everybody engaged. This is so much fun. And get excellent feedback. 80% have voted. All right, I'm gonna close the poll in three, two, one, get it in, close and share. So last time it was all over the place. This time it seems to be more focused in the morning. Uh, I would say the majority want that by noon, sometime in the morning. And then there's a few that also say, uh, just send it when you get a chance. Okay. Excellent feedback. Thank you. We got one more for you coming up. And special weather briefings. So these are the live go-to briefings like we're doing right now. During high impact events, we will initiate a special weather briefing to provide you the latest information in this format. Uh, examples over the last year, uh, we did some back in last September before the Labor Day storm. But from November until October, in the last 365 days, the seven briefings that we did were the January 13th storm. Uh, it was a heavy wind and heavy rain and wind storm. The March 25th through 28th uh, wind storm, which ended up being having some very significant impacts for dust and closing uh, I-90 and many roads. We actually did four briefings leading up to that event. And then during the heat wave, we did two briefings, once on June 24th and once on June 30th. And if you look at that, I uh, put these little notches right here when we did those briefings and how it compared to the impacts that we were predicting. So now think about those special weather briefings. And the final question is another Goldilocks one. We did seven live briefings in the last year. Is that just right, not enough, or too many? Sip of the coffee. All right, 70% of the votes in. We'll close it in three, two, one. Close and share. Oh, very interesting. I think that is, that is an increase in the not enough. So that's very, uh, that's telling to us that there are more people that think we could be doing more. Okay, great information. Let's hide that and then go back to the presentation. All right. So I've been talking a lot about how to stay informed leading up to a weather event, whether it's a minor or an extreme weather event. We're gonna be providing messaging, different types of tools to get that word out ahead of time. 
Now I'm going to talk about during an event. If we are in the middle of a major windstorm, snowstorm, how are you going to stay informed about what's happening, what's happening in your location? Hopefully, all of you or most of you have signed up to the INWS, Interactive National Weather Service. The Weather Service doesn't have an app, but this is the best way that our partners can sign up and get notifications to your email, to your phone, text, uh, and it's only available to you, to our Weather Service partners. So if you have not done this, go to inws.incept.noaa.gov. And of course, I will share all these slides afterwards if you don't get that uh, web address. Uh, sign up. If you have any problems, please let me know and I can help you. So that's one way to stay informed. Another great way that I cannot stress enough is NWS chat. The chat room is your way to talk to the weather service forecasters real time, 24-7. Uh, the media will be in there. Uh, we'll have emergency managers, utilities, uh, transportation. It is an excellent way to get multiple different jurisdictions and organizations, agencies, all sharing information in one place. Uh, there are, there's the ability to have private chat. So if you want to have a conversation that you don't want anybody else to see, or you have a, have a question, you can do that as well. But please sign up for NWS chat so you can have that and ready to go this winter. Um, the one thing I want to talk about was the local storm reports or LSRs. As we get that information, we will update that on that page. So as we get power outages, uh, down trees, closed roads, um, any types of impacts, flooding impacts, this is where we're going to graph that. We're gonna send in a local storm report and then all of our partners can actually view that real time as we get that information. So it's a great way to share this and everybody to be looking at the same thing across multiple agencies. All right, here's kind of the summary of the messaging strategies uh, talked about. We want to design this to help you stay aware, uh, to help make you make more informed decisions. Uh, it only makes sense if you guys understand and can take appropriate action. So that's why we're doing this. Again, thank you for your feedback. Uh, we are always trying to refine and improve and be more efficient our messaging. So your feedback is critical to that. You don't have to wait until next spring workshop to do that. If you have any ideas for me, questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. There is my email right there and I'll have my email at the end as well. All right, so let's do a quick recap. Uh, Charlotte Dewey is one of our, she is our newest lead forecaster. She's been here for just over a year. And Char helps me out with a lot of the outreach. And so she is going to talk about some of the recent high impact events. Char, are you on the line? Yes, I'm here. Awesome. All right, take it over. Okay. So, hi, everybody. Um, so, I was part of the spring uh, partner workshop as well. So, <clears throat> maybe I sound a little familiar. Um, but it's good to be with everybody. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and talk about just a select few of our more notable higher impact uh, weather events over the last year or so. Um, I find it's helpful to kind of go back through some of these events as we go through long periods of no weather or long periods of busy weather. It's harder to remember what some of the events that have taken place and that's gone over the last year or so. Um, so I started back in December just to pick out one of the events and then I'm going to go through um, closer to real time. So the first event I wanted to talk about was back in December. So last year we saw several winter storms come through in December leading up to the end of the year that brought rounds of snow and rain and wind to the region. Uh, more notable, this one was just a few days before Christmas. So we saw some strong winds which then took down numerous trees, created power outages. Uh, we did see some snow, some snow reports. We had um, around seven to eight inches in Mazama and Twisp up in the Metau Valley. And then as the picture shows, we had some down trees and power outages down around the Pullman area. Um, some, that's just a couple areas. Um, the next event that I was gonna talk about 
was the January windstorm. Um, this may be a little bit more familiar with people of remembering what happened, but after the periods of lots of rain and snow in, in December into January, we had a larger wind event in January that brought down a large area of damage for trees and power outages. This picture was from the Comstock Park here in Spokane, but we saw a lot of tree damage into Coeur d'Alene, into central and northern Idaho with lots of power outages. Um, some of the wind gusts we saw that, that day or those days were from 40 to 60 miles an hour. I think there was even a couple that were close to 70 miles an hour across the region. Um, some of the snow reports we had seven to 12 inches around the Leavenworth area and about four and a half to five inches near Boyd's. And you can see looking at that, um, that bar across the top that Andy was talking about, just trying to point out what type of um, impact these events were pointing at. So the next one I want to talk about is in March. And so we saw after our wet, very wet December and January, we saw a period of very dry conditions. So March typically is known when we see blustery weather, windy weather, we can see rain and snow, but for March of this year, we saw very dry conditions. So with a storm that was moving through that brought some strong winds um, and a pretty strong cold front, we saw blowing dust. And so this event, you can see on our impact ticker at the top, this was one of our extreme events. And so like Andy mentioned, we did several live briefings leading up to this event. And it was a pretty well forecasted event um, in our eyes leading up to it as far as the models were concerned. But we saw wind speeds of 50 to 70 miles an hour. And this was very widespread. So it went from Okanagan, Chelan counties, Lincoln counties, all the way down into Idaho for Nez Pierce County, Garfield counties. And we had numerous road closures for several hours. We had uh, visibilities with blowing gusts down to around one to two miles, if not locally lower than that. So it was a pretty good um, event that covered quite a large portion of the area. Our next event Before was just a car, I, I wanted to add on this one. This was a really unique case because uh, we had the December windstorm, um, or I'm sorry, the January windstorm. And then this one, there was indications that this was going to be even more extreme. And so we really started to message this one early. And that's why we did those four live briefings. And for some areas, we ended up over forecasting the winds. We didn't see the winds that uh, the potential was there, but they were not quite realized. But what did happen was that uh, the blowing dust, while there was still uh, not as much damage as the January windstorm, the blowing dust was incredible and it shut down, I, I believe if Ryan Overton's on here, he might correct me. I believed it shut down I-90 for eight hours that day, along with many other uh, state routes. So there was some very significant impacts. And so when we think about these extreme, this magenta color impacts, that's what we're talking about. It's gonna have widespread implications uh, for, for commerce for everybody. So that's what, when we start advertising for these extreme events, that's what we're talking about. Sorry for letting me, thanks for letting me jump in there. All right, next one. Yeah, no, not a problem. Um, yeah, that one, that's why two on that impact ticker at the top, um, you know, we didn't start out with an orange or a red. We kind of went right to the magenta color because it did look very strong and very um, rare. So our next event um, into April, we saw again, several pretty strong cold fronts coming through and it sounds like wind was our main uh, weather hazard for several months. But again, we saw some strong winds. Uh, this one was a little bit weaker. We saw 45 to 65 mile an hour wind gusts and again, large areas of power outages with tree damage. Um, and we did see some reports of blowing dust, but I don't believe it was quite as devastating as the one event in March. And so after April, we went into, um, into June. And so we saw some thunderstorms moving through the areas. We started to move out of our spring weather and moving into our summer weather. Uh, we had a couple days of early morning thunderstorms with lightning and hail. 
Um, one day, one of the days, I think it was the June 13th storm, we had a lot of lightning with that one and it moved from south to north across our eastern area, so along the Cascade Slopes and eastern Columbia Basin. And then the 15th, this one, this event was more focused right along the Washington-Idaho border. So we saw a lot of the hail in parts of Idaho. Um, so pretty good sized hail. Those are pictures from that event. So we had uh, reports of one inch, maybe just a little bit larger than one inch hail. So that's pretty good for thunderstorms up in this region. And again, on the, the impact ticker, you can see we had the orange, the moderate, moderate events up there. And then we had a couple weeks of, about a week or so of quiet weather, but our next event was our late June into early July. And I would say if you were to stop and think back to all the weather events across the last year, for me anyway, the couple that stand out were the January windstorm and the heat wave. That's what I can remember most vividly. Um, maybe it was just due to the damage, but for the June into July heat wave, this one was very rare and it was historical and unprecedented because we've not seen this type of heat before in this part of the country and for such a, a longer duration. So what was special about this one is, is we saw the conditions beginning to develop and coming into the forecast several days out. So we, that ticker at the top with the impact colors, we had several days where we sent out our weather briefings that had that high and extreme impacts. And like Andy mentioned, we also did some special live briefings for this too. So we were trying to get the messaging out and it was a collaboration across many of the offices up in the Pacific and Inland Northwest that were, that were dealing with this. So one of the pictures here that I show, it has a whole bunch of red dots, which I realize is completely unreadable at this level, but it's just showing all of the locations that broke or it broke or tied their maximum all-time temperature or daily temperature. So you can see there was a large area that, that set new record temperatures for high temperatures in this week time period. So it was a pretty notable event. And then some of the other um, impacts we were seeing, I think this one, this picture on the left was from Washington DOT, and it was showing that some of the roads were seeing issues with the very hot temperatures. So the heat wave was kind of a result of a very long, hot, dry summer, and it all came together at the end of June. And then the next event that I was going to talk about was our was the last one I was going to talk about. After we saw the heat in late June, early July, we did have some thunderstorms. This was our next round of thunderstorms come through in mid-July. But after seeing such a long dry period, these thunderstorms were pretty dry thunderstorms. So meaning that they had very little precipitation. There wasn't a lot of rain with them, but there was still lightning. And so you add lightning to a very dry surface and dry forest, and this is what sparks fires, wildfires. So this was more so, I would say this was kind of the start of our fire weather season, um, which also lasted through much of the late summer. Um, but we did see a lot of uh, thunderstorm, we, we did see a lot of fire starts from these thunderstorms in mid-July. And so this, these, these pictures were specifically from the Nez Pelham area in North Central Washington. And that's all I have for going over the weather events for the last year. So if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. So we are getting some questions in. I just uh, opened up the questions box and thank you for seeing that. Uh, there's questions, there's chat. Please take advantage of that. Um, and I'm seeing a few in here that I'm gonna address right now. Uh, let's see. For briefings, if you want us to add different partners, I see Henry Allen ask about adding city managers, send me an email and we can get those folks added to the distribution list. Uh, and you could, and so we could do it that way. So we can send it directly to them, the invitation, or you can forward it, uh, whatever, whatever is your preference. And then also got a question about LSRs. Uh, can those be shared and included in your mapping? Absolutely, those are all uh, GIS based. That information is public and anybody can grab it. So if you've got the technical skills to know how to go out and grab that information and uh, plot it on your own mapping, then that is all available for you uh, 
to do. Uh, all right. I think, and then we had some questions. Uh, Simone asked about advisories. Yes, we'll have more about that coming up. All right. Thank you, Shar. Great job. And that really sets the tone for where, boy, what, what a year it's been. Um, a lot of different types of weather that we have seen, weather impacts uh, from, and I think uh, Robin is going to talk about this coming up, uh, from the drought conditions, the, how dry it was. It started out very wet and windy, and then it was dry, and then we had the record heat followed by the thunderstorms, and it was just that perfect combination to result in a horrible fire season, which, again, I don't want to give anything away from what Robin's going to talk about here soon. Uh, so before we take a break, I'm going to go over some of the changes that we have coming into this winter season. And this first one's a big one. Um, well, it's a big one for us. I'm excited. The template that we have used for the last, my goodness, three or four years for our email briefings is changing. Our start date is December 1st. So here in the next few weeks, we are going to, you're going to see a change in how our template looks for our email briefings. And I think it is a big improvement from what we have been doing. Uh, we have a team at Western Region with the National Weather Service that has come up with this version 2.0, and uh, they have some really great ideas of how we can organize and share this information. So this is just an example that uh, is being used around the Weather Service to kind of show a lot of it's the same. It'll have the key points. It'll, it'll use a five-colored tier system five-tiered color system. Uh, the colors are a little bit different, and that is because uh, there is some research on colorblind or color-sensitive groups of what is easier to see. So we made some adjustments to, those, to that color system to make it easier to both print in black and white or to see if you have colorblind or if you're in that color-sensitive group. So a few changes to that, and then at the bottom uh, of that new example, you see the hazards impacts, hazard impacts are going to be grouped by hazard or a timeline. So it just gives us more flexibility of showing you and letting you know what potential impacts and where and the timing and the confidence and all of that. So all that great information that we've been sharing is going to be packaged just a little bit different. We're going through that training and we're getting spun up on that but here in the next couple of weeks, you, you will see that change happening from us and we'll have this new look to our weather briefings. Excuse me. Oh, along with that, uh, our weekly briefings are going to change slightly as well. We've used the same template for maybe five years on that. Uh, this version 2.0, this uh, consistency effort from Western Region, they came up with a new template for our briefings not just the one pager, but actual briefings. And so you'll see some changes in that too, but I think you'll like it. It's much better organized. Robin, are you on? Do you want to talk about these next two slides? Sure, I can. Uh, Good, morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Robin Fox. I am the, uh, I guess, new, still new, senior, uh, excuse me, service hydrologist for the Spokane office. And I've been a longtime forecaster. Uh, but I wanted to uh, touch on some of the changes we are going to be seeing with hydrology products starting as soon as November 16th. That's when we're going to shift things over. But the main thing we're going to be seeing is a consolidation of the flood products. And what this includes is with watches, flood watches, anything that is going to be caused uh, flooding by excessive rainfall. Uh, will be under the title of flood watch. So anything that leads to heavy rain, uh, snow melt, that's going to lead to flooding is going to be called a flood watch. So that's going to be the majority of the cases. Um, but there are some exceptions that we're still going to use the term a flash flood watch, and that will be reserved for anything that has to do with the dam failure and burn scar flooding that has to do with intense rainfall from thunderstorms. So uh, that is still going to be available uh, for our area. In addition, uh, for flood advisories, we're going to have a consolidation that's going to 
uh, cover all the various different types of advisories for floods under one title. So we're just going to blanket it as a flood advisory and put more of the details within the products for you to know what the concerns are and where. And that also leads to the next part of this hazard simplification that has to do with the, uh, the way we're going to uh, compose the products. We're going to have bullets in there that's going to explain what the concern is, uh, where it is, what the impacts are, and the times. And we already see this in many of our uh, warning and watch products right now, and now it's just going to flow right into our hydro products uh, for the coming winter season. Thank you, Robin. And so as I alluded to, we're doing a lot of uh, hazard simplification, and this is what Robin was talking about as well. If you think back the last couple of years, we have shared different surveys, and this was a nationwide effort to improve the way that the National Weather Service sends messages. Uh, watches, warnings, advisories has always been our go-to, and understandably, it can be confusing. A lot of folks still have a hard time understanding the difference, and I do not blame them. A lot of times we're in the office debating, is this an advisory? No, let's upgrade to a warning. And does it matter? Does it matter to the public or to our users if it's an advisory or warning? Do they understand that difference? So a lot of the feedback is that we need to simplify that. And so one of the ways that we're going to do that, we're going to keep the watch and warning the same, but we're, what is going to change is the advisory and the special weather statement is going to go to plain, head, plain language headlines. And an example of that, here's some of those these examples that have been uh, thrown around, is instead of a wind advisory, wind advisories in effect, it would say windy, westerly winds gusting to 40 miles per hour, or caution, you know, uh, coastal flooding expected today, obviously not for the inland northwest, uh, or instead of a wind chill advisory, you have the very cold tonight with wind chills negative five and negative 10. So replacing the advisories with like cautionary statements or cautionary headlines uh, just to help get rid of one of those tools that we have, the watch warning advisory, and simplify it between cautionary, uh, you know, minor impacts, or the warnings, which is more significant impacts, watches warnings. And I had another graphic on that, but I think I got it out of place. Um, so I'll go back to that in a second. Uh, something else that I just threw in the last minute, which is why this is out of place, is the GHWO, Graphical Hazardous Weather Outlook. This is a way to use those five tier colors and illustrate it on a map. So this is ex still experimental. We're learning how this really works for us or if this won't work for us. Uh, but hopefully, as we refine this one, this might be another tool that you can look at and these little chicklets that are on the right side will give you an indication of when there might be a hazard, potential hazard, and what that hazard is, and then how significant that is. And so this might be a good briefing tool for yourself to just look over real quick and say, oh, look at that. We have non-thunderstorm or high winds expected on Sunday. Let me take a closer look at that day. And then you can look at the forecast and then you know, ask questions if you need to. So this might be just a way to, for you to be, to be more situ, situationally aware of upcoming hazards. It's experimental. It definitely needs some refining and improving, but this is another one that we're working on and might be very useful in the near future. Something else that I wanted to go over that this probably only affects a small subset of our partners, uh, but non-weather emergency messages in WIMS and I have that whole list on the right side of these, I believe, 17 different non-weather emergency messages that can be sent out uh, through the emergency alerting system. And so what is changing for us is now we will finally have the capability to easily disseminate those in whims through the weather service software and get that onto NOAA weather radio. So these are specifically for emergency managers or cities that have that IPAWS, FEMA IPAWS capability. Uh, this is just kind of a, a FYI, if there are child abduction or law enforcement warnings, 
or especially the most common is, uh, where did it go? I'm looking for it. The shelter in place or the evacuation notices. Uh, those can be shared on NOAA Weather Radio, just another tool in your, in your toolbox to get the word out for dangerous conditions. So for those small subset that affects, keep that in mind and uh, we'll find out more about that here soon. So somehow I messed up and I skipped a couple slides. Uh, let me just back out of this and see where they went. I thought I had one in here that was a timeline, but apparently I deleted it. Okay, uh, what I was gonna talk about was this advisory timeline. Uh, this is happening over the next couple of years. And so I, I found this timeline that just kind of showed where we are now. And over the next couple of years, we'll, we will continue to get feedback from our partners through surveys. So if you see us sending that survey information, and if you have, if you wanna have any say in what the plain language headlines look like, please take part in those surveys. The goal is to have all of that completed by 2024. So over the next couple of years, you'll see some more information coming from us about hazard, simpli hazard simplification. With that, I think it is time for a short break. So let's do nine minutes. I think we're ahead of schedule, which isn't bad. Uh, so let's get back together at 10.55 p.m. Not p.m. 10.55 a.m. in nine minutes, and we're going to pick up with Robin. She's going to take us through the fire season and the hydro outlook and uh, the seasonal outlook as well. So come back in nine minutes, go stretch your legs, get some coffee, do all those fun things. And I am going through all the questions that I see in here and answering those one by one. If you have any other questions, be feel free to, to jump in there and send me that. Otherwise, I'll see you in nine, eight and a half minutes. Robin, I'm gonna give you control. Thank you. Just as soon as I remember how to do it. <laughs> there it is. We see, yep, got it. Great.
We'll get started in five minutes. Got another minute, but uh, while you're coming back to the computer and finding the right screen, Robin, can you share, I just added a slide. Can you share that timeline? Sure, I'm trying to find it. It should be the slide right before where you were. You just go back one slide. Oh, you have here. Not sharing. Hold there on. it is. Is that it? There it is. I just had to redo this. Okay. There. There it is. Uh, so Simone asked about this, the timeline, and th this was the image that I thought I had in there, but it got deleted somehow at the last moment. Um, 
this is the timeline. It's a very rough timeline. It just basically says between now and 2024, <laughs> we're going to get all this done. Uh, but it's going to, there's going to be feedback webinars uh, to determine what that's going to happen, uh, update to the in that National Weather Service policy and the software so that we can do it, the public education outreach and training that happens. And then finally, before implementation, we'll have to test it. So that is just kind of a very vague, rough timeline of what's going to happen to get us from getting rid of those new advisories and the new plain language statements, uh, what has to happen between now and 2024. But um, sometimes that's the way the government, the pace of government is kind of slow and very deliberate. Uh, so hopefully the next couple of years, we'll, this will get done and, and you'll see some improvements. So with that, it is 56. <laughs> AM, and I think it's time to move on to Robin's presentation. So take it over, Robin. All right, well, thank you, Andy. And again, I'm Robin Fox, the service hydrologist at the Spokane office. And I'm going to uh, cover uh, a little bit about the fire season. And uh, as we go out of it, what we can be expecting in the winter to come. So first off, I know it has been an active fire season region wide. And the first thing I want to do is just kind of review 2021, looking back at the last 12 months, or as what we're calling it, the water year of 2021 for the inland Northwest. Temperatures were above normal for the entire region, and this is for a 12 month period. Meanwhile, we see the precipitation was below normal in many areas. Um, especially about 70 to 90 percent of normal east of the Cascades. Uh, we did see a signal of above normal precipitation in the Cascades. That was due to that winter snowpack that we had. But for the most part, it was drier than normal and some areas even less than 50 percent of normal in the lower Columbia Basin. So uh, we're going to go look um, at a broader scale on by season and show more of these impacts and how they relate to one another. So how did we get there? So let's look at the winter season and the spring season. The top two maps show temperature and precipitation from January through March. And with temperatures, you can see that above normal temperatures spanned east of the Cascades across the region. Um, through our winter season. And precipitation, yes, it was a La Nina year, and we did benefit with plenty of precipitation, not only on the west side, but moved across north central Washington into northeast Washington with that snowpack growing. Uh, unfortunately, the Columbia Basin stayed on the dry side through the winter. And then as we went through the spring of 2021, or here's from April to June, we can see temperatures still remained above normal, some of them in the top 10% of normal for the spring. But I think the most noteworthy thing about the spring was the lack of precipitation. By the end of February, uh, the pattern switched. And instead of getting storms with rain and snow, we were getting storms with wind and not much precipitation at all. And, and we were seeing for that period of April through June, some of the record driest conditions happening, not only in the Cascades, but the Columbia Basin and even up into Northeast Washington and North Idaho. So very little precipitation fell across the region. So as Shar discussed, uh, the summer, our unprecedented heat wave with record hot temperatures that we saw, um, especially at the end of June, June 28th, I believe every weather observation site east of the Cascades in our CWA or county warning area reported triple digit temperatures. So that was just amazing. And along with that record heat, we had the record dryness as well. And uh, here's a map that shows for um, February all the way through September, we had record dryness across a big portion of eastern Washington and into North Idaho, uh, something that has not happened um, that we have seen along with that heat wave um, in a very long time. So 
now we had a, a La Nina winter. We had this abundance of mountain snow that came from January through February. And it, it did uh, bring us an increased snowpack in the Cascades and other mountains as well. But as we moved into that dry spell, uh, that, that precipitation just shut off. So what we were left with was the snow that we had early in the year. And as temperatures warmed, that snowpack was melting and that provided us a good water supply as we were going through the summer season. Now keep in mind, our mountain snows pack is vital for water supply across our region, especially what we see um, in many of the uh, streams and rivers. But what was really impressive is that the area, even though we had all that dryness, we were still seeing near normal water supply for areas near the Cascades. Actually on both sides of the Cascades uh, fared well. It was as you moved away from the Cascades, so extreme Eastern Washington into North Idaho, water supply levels fell to less than 50%. And that was just because we weren't getting that moisture in the spring. So the unseasonable dry conditions increased the drought across the region. And the Drought Monitor is a national product that's issued weekly to assess the broad scale conditions of dryness in the country. And it's been around for about 20 years. And it ranges in scale from a D0, which is abnormally dry, all the way to a D4, which is exceptional drought. And Washington and Idaho is no stranger to drought. We've seen it. Um, in fact, the lower Columbia Basin has been under a D2 to D3 drought since last year. And here's a map that shows the start of the summer and how dry the conditions were in the Pacific Northwest. But what was really uh, amazing is after we went through that heat wave and all the dryness of the spring, the drought expanded and we reached D4 levels across a big portion of Eastern Washington and North Idaho. D4 in Washington for the first time in 20 years. Um, so this has never happened before. And this was during the height of the drought. So the main impacts for the drought in our region was basically dry land agriculture. Um, this uh, drought was hitting during the springtime uh, when they were harvesting the uh, winter wheat and planting for the spring wheat. And uh, we were seeing those impacts affecting both those crops along with barley and the pasture lands. And here's a graph that shows the, uh, the, the index, the, the crop reports that were coming for this year across Washington. And you can see how it is just off the chart compared to the last 20 or so years. Other impacts included the uh, ground moisture, the low soil moisture across the region that lack of precipitation that we were getting in the spring and into the early summer caused the soils to dry out considerably. And along with that, once our snowpack had melted off, our stream flows dropped to near record levels, especially as we got to the end of summer um, into the early fall before the fall rains kicked in. So when the rain did come, it also brought the lightning. And as Shar mentioned, we did see several rounds of thunderstorms in July that did not produce a lot of rainfall, they, so they were considered dry. And uh, they these thunderstorms continued into early August. And here's a map that shows lightning strikes that happened during the first two weeks in July. Quite a bit of storms moved through the area. And as you saw, some of them produced some severe conditions, strong thunderstorms, uh, but the lightning was uh, very impressive that happened across the region. And it also increased the wildfire threat because conditions were so dry across the region. So no surprising wildfire season ramped up by mid-July and it remained active into September, which is typically our driest time of the year. But being that it was so dry and drought stricken, it was an extra concern. And after those thunderstorms popped up across the region, uh, we, we saw them developing not only in Washington and Idaho, but Montana and Oregon as well. 
And it's not surprising they matched up where those driest conditions or where the drought monitor highlighted the driest concerns. So we are still tabulating the, the stats for this wildfire season, but our preliminary levels show the number of acres burned was over 538,000 acres. And the number of fires were about 1,393. Uh, we'll get those official stats by the end of the year. But if we look, oh, excuse me, what happened last year, actually, which is the second line, 2020, the total was just over 800,000 acres burned. And the number of fires, a little less than this year, about 1,124. But keep in mind, last year's total for 2020, we saw the most of the acres burned happen during that Labor Day windstorm. So they weren't lightning started fires. They were more driven by the winds and caused those acres burn to increase substantially. But 2020 stands at the list as the number two in the list of uh, fire seasons for acres burned. And the top one remains at 2015 with uh, just over 913,000 acres burned um, and the number of fires about 1,372. So what is left behind are with those fire perimeters are the burn scars. And here's a map that shows areas of fire perimeters that just dot our areas from north central Washington up across northeast Washington and the Okanagan Highlands, along with north Idaho as well and parts of the Blue Mountains and uh, down at the Camas Prairie. We have at least 20 new burn scars that we're gonna be monitoring, not only this winter, but for the years to come. And compared to last year, where most of those fires took place across the Columbia Basin, the Palouse, the Okanagan Valley, where areas were very uh, flat and grass covered, uh, these burned areas, most of them are in steep terrain with a lot of timber that was burned. So many of these areas are now susceptible to flash flooding and or debris flows during intense rainfall events. So why is there a big concern after a wildfire moves through the area? Well, when you have an intense burned area, um, it burns the vegetation, it burns the timber, uh, so nothing is left but the burnt ground. And when the fire is hot enough, it can burn the ground and scorch it, that it changes the factors in the soil. So it becomes more hydrophobic, which means when you add the water to the soil, it's not going to soak in, it's going to run off. And uh, this will increase more runoff in the streams and down the steep slopes. It will also move more debris and sediments into channels. And in some areas that may not have seen flooding or debris flows in the past, um, if you are downhill, downstream of a burn scar, uh, plan for the unexpected because we're going to be seeing some movement of water and sediment when we get our rains coming in the um, months and years to come. But we do know that not all storms are the same. Some are dry and they don't have much rain, but they may have lightning and wind. Other storms can produce some light rain or sprinkles maybe about an inch over 12 hours and usually leads to no problems. But it's those few that can produce those intense heavy rainfall or the prolonged moderate rains that we see in the fall that can lead to problems, especially in the steep terrain, especially on the burn soil, along with as we're getting to the winter season, the frozen ground as well. And the big drops that will stir up the mud and debris and lead to issues. So it is the National Weather Service watches and warnings and our messaging that is going to help let you know on the days that we have can expect some potential problems. So I just wanna do a little reminder. I know Andy kind of talked about this with our different types of products that we issue, but it's always good to review the watch and warnings and what the difference is. Uh, here's an example for a flash flood example. Uh, when we see the conditions looking favorable for a potential event, 
where we see maybe about a 50% chance of it developing over a broad area, we'll be issuing a watch um, for a flood watch for a particular heavy rain event. And we can have a lead time of up to 48 hours in advance on this. Warnings are issued when an event is imminent or about to occur, and it'll be for a smaller area and a shorter lead time. And with most warnings, we'll be sending them out for emergency alert systems and alerts on NOAA weather radio. And for those particular dangerous events, and we have this capability for flash flood warnings when we think that they are going to cause a significant event, a dangerous situation, we can activate wireless emergency alerts that will beep and buzz on cell phones in the area. Now keep in mind, these are events that threaten life and property. So uh, these are the, the big events, like Shar was pointing out, that uh, caused uh, a lot of our issues over the last year. But other things that we're going to have to keep in mind with the incoming precipitation and winter events are our rivers. And I just want to point out a couple changes that we've made to our AHAPS page, which is our advanced hydro predictive services page, um, which is linked on our web page under the river section. Um, we have updated every one of our forecast points and uh, river gauge points to include up to the most current data. So if you look down under a hydrograph, you were going to find some of the historic crests and the recent crests that come to just this year. So we made those updates this year. In addition, we added some low water records since we were into a drought during our summer season, which is the lowest stream flow conditions. We've added so those levels in there as well and added some of those levels on the hydrograph so you can see where the low stages are. I also want to point out that with each river forecast point, um, you can view the forecast from the River Forecast Center to give you an idea of the impacts for flooding in the next uh, five, seven days in advance. But we also have the ability to look at probability information for each site that can give you a little more idea of, of the confidence of the levels that you're seeing in the official forecast. Um, we have it for the 10-day forecast that can give you an idea of what the chances are that we could get to higher levels. And also the weekly chance of exceeding river stages, which we found really important as we get through the end of the winter season and that spring melt-off season to see when those levels are going to be creeping up to flood stage or not. So um, I encourage you to keep an eye on that and bookmark them onto those river forecast points that you find important for your area. And we're all going to also going to be seeing some changes with that web page, the AHAPS page in the coming year. We're going to be switching the name over to the National Water Prediction Services, and it's going to be incorporating more GIS um, information, so more layers to view, including precipitation and uh, forecasts and, and rainfall that has fallen, along with more guidance from the national water model. So there'll be uh, more information to see uh, more hydrology and river forecasts for many of our points. So stay tuned on that. All right, so I want to just kind of touch on some of the uh, training that we have available right now for the fall season. Uh, right now, we are offering some fall weather spotter and observer training. It kicked off uh, at the end of October, and we still have a couple classes left coming up. These are all virtual, and it's a way for our weather volunteers to get spun up and ready for the winter season. So we have one available coming up next week on November 9th for our spotter training that we're going to concentrate on cold uh, season reports. And also new this year, we're offering a training class on Coco Ross, which is the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network. And it's a great source that we're getting a lot of the rainfall and snow reports from many of our observers. And we're going to be offering a, another class on that in mid-November. 
These classes are free, open to any weather enthusiast, and you can register right from our webpage. Um, we have it linked at the top of the page. And like I mentioned, the two classes we are offering, uh, one is on snow measurements and the uh, different steps that's needed to get an accurate snow measurement from snowfall to snow depth and liquid water equivalent. So there's lots of steps involved with that. And then with the cold season spotter training, we again discuss snow and freezing rain and high winds and all the different aspects that we're going to be looking for from reports from our spotters this year. All right, so with that, we're going to flow right into our seasonal outlook. And I know I discussed what we've seen so far this year in 2021. So here we're going to step into and look at our crystal ball and see what we can anticipate in the months to come. So, so far this fall, we have switched water seasons. At the start of October, we are now in the 2022 water season, water year. And uh, here are some of the, uh, some of the uh, reflections for temperature and precipitation that we've seen in the last couple months. So uh, very interesting after our very dry year that we had um, at the start of 2021. For September and October, temperatures have been pretty close to seasonal levels across the region. A little bit cooler near the Cascades and a little warmer in North Idaho, but for the most part, right around close to normal for the last several weeks. But what's very interesting and good news is the fall rains that have arrived. And uh, those rounds of rains have been beneficial for many areas. We see um, all across Washington, North Idaho, in, into Oregon, uh, we have seen above normal precipitation, um, maybe some areas close to much above normal, but very needed rains uh, in many areas. Uh, the only uh, exception would be down on the Camas Prairie and the uh, LC Valley that still needs more rain and hopefully we'll be seeing that in the uh, days and weeks to come. Uh, so I, I talked about the drought monitor and where the drought was this summer. Well, it's still persisting, but we have seen improvements and these fall rains have helped quite a bit. Here is what the uh, current drought monitor has for us with uh, some D4 levels still across the lower Columbia Basin into the LC Valley where conditions still are, are lacking for precipitation. But we're seeing quite a bit of improvements across the northern counties and in North Idaho. And the outlook is good. So we have a monthly and seasonal drought outlook that covers the entire country. And uh, they are showing that drought will be remaining, but it will be improving. It is going to be a slow event to improve our drought conditions since we were so dry this summer. It could take up to precipitation of 150% of normal to try to get back to where we were just a year or so ago. So uh, we're just going to be chipping away at the drought levels in the weeks and months to come. So as we're looking at our seasonal outlook, it's important to keep in mind what is the uh, La Nina, El Nino status. And uh, if you remember last winter, it was a La Nina year. And as we're going into this winter, winter it looks like she is back again. La Nina is uh, expected to uh, remain for us for the winter season. Uh, we have an alert out for a La Nina advisory. Um, and this is caused by um, the equatorial sea surface temperatures in the Pacific that are below normal. And here is the map right here of the Pacific and sea surface temperatures have been trending cooler than normal. And this is what designates a La Nina um, across uh, not only the Pacific, but much of North America. So La Nina conditions have developed and they are expected to continue with an 87% chance from December 2021 to February 2022. Um, and we have a probability map right here that shows the chances of La Nina and El Nino. And we see 
a lot of blue lines. So it's increasing that confidence that we're going to be moving into a La Nina year uh, as we go through the winter and uh, possibly into some of the spring months, but that looks like it, the confidence decreases and uh, we see more of a change happening in the spring months. So here is our typical wintertime La Nina pattern. Uh, one thing I want to point out is the uh, polar jet stream that becomes quite an important feature as we go through a La Nina winter, but it also is a bit quite variable with it. Um, it can bring us a lot of storms that bring us copious amounts of precipitation, rain and mountain snow. Um, it can bring us colder weather as well. It all depends on where that storm track sets up. And if we remember last year, yes, we were getting those winter storms that were building up that mountain snowpack. Um, but then we had a shift in the pattern as we got into March. And instead of getting storms bringing us rain and snow, we were getting storms coming down from the north, bringing us more wind than precipitation. So uh, the jury is still out right now on what type of jet stream we're going to be seeing, but the pattern is there that La Nina will be with us this winter. So we have uh, local studies that have been done in our office looking at the various observation sites and calculating snow amounts, comparing them to El Nino events versus La Nina events. And we do see that we have an increased chance of above normal snowfall at many of these sites with La Nina winters. But more specifically, let's look at Spokane. Uh, normally, we see about an average around 48 inches of snow per year. And these are lines that are showing La Nina snowfalls over the past 70 so years. And you can see the majority of the uh, blue lines are above normal that we see. So even for Spokane, this uh, kind of shows we get a um, little more than half of the events are above normal. Many of them are very close to normal um, that we see, but no, not every La Nina event is the same. So uh, expecting what we had last year may not work of what we're going to be seeing in this winter. And another thing to keep in mind is this is consecutive La Nina winters. So uh, we've seen this through the uh, decades that we can get back to back La Ninas. And uh, we've looked at some of the past studies, especially for Spokane. And uh, we see about five other out of the 10 times this has happened, uh, we've had above normal snowfall. Um, four out of 10 times, we've had near normal snowfall, and we did have one year back in 2011 and 2012 that we had below normal snowfall. So it looks like near to above normal snowfall typically has happened before around Spokane with La Nina winters. Uh, here's another thing that we look at, comparing consecutive La Nina winters um, is looking at analog years and comparing what has happened with temperature and precipitation in past events. So it does show during some of these past events for temperatures that yes, they have trended cooler than normal, especially uh, all across Washington into North Idaho. Um, but what is really startling is, is seeing precipitation wise, they trend to near normal to slightly below normal for precipitation. So uh, very interesting stats as well. Uh, we have uh, seasonal models that give us an outlook on what we can be expecting for the upcoming season. And here is one which is called the North American Multi Model Ensemble. And what it's showing for, for temperatures as we go through the December, January, February time range is uh, temperatures trending near normal for this period across the inland Northwest. And precipitation for the same period, we see a lot of green highlighting on the area. So it is trending to above normal precipitation for this model. Now here is what the Climate Prediction Center points out. 
as we go through the next some months to come. This is the one month outlook uh, for November and it is highlighting uh, equal chances of temperatures being at, near, or below normal. Um, I Typically, we can anticipate more seasonal temperatures as we go through the month of November. And for precipitation, uh, it is showing increased odds of above normal precipitation, not only for the Pacific Northwest, but Montana and into Wyoming as well. Uh, if we look at the three month outlook from the Climate Prediction Center, this is from November through January. Uh, for the inland Northwest, it still keeps equal chances for temperatures, so more seasonal temperatures, but it is showing a, uh, um, a signal of cooler than normal temperatures moving into Western Washington as we go through the, uh, the winter season. But the signal of above normal precipitation, it's a good La Nina single signal that is across the region. And if we step just one more month in the future, so December through February, the Climate Prediction Center is really stretching below normal temperatures all the way across the region. And this is something that we see with La Nina events that we see more of the impacts kicking in at the latter part of the winter. So temperatures may start out near seasonal at the beginning of the winter, but then trend cooler as we go through the winter months and then maybe into the spring as well. Um, and again, for precipitation, that signal of above normal chances remains for the region. So that was a lot of information I covered, but to summarize it, we still have a drought over our area. And even though we've had those rains this fall, we need a lot more to get out of the drought. Um, but we're gonna see slow improvements as we continue to keep the precipitation in the forecast. Uh, La Nina is favored for our upcoming winter and the outlook is favoring elevated odds of cooler and wetter than normal conditions, especially we get into the latter portion of the winter. And also winter is coming. So anticipate those storms with snow and ice and rain and even floods as well, because we're gonna be seeing the chances of increased precipitation. Um, the, the chances that we are gonna see flooding occurring will be elevated as well. And I also just wanna point out that one event does not make a season. I know we're going to keep in our heads those specific events, those big winter storms, um, but it's going to take the average of these events over the entire season to make the season. So uh, that's what I have for our seasonal outlook. And uh, we can go to the wrap up and I don't know if Angie, if I wanna pass it over to you. Yeah. So thank you so much, Robin. Great job. That was a lot of information, but that is excellent information. Um, and you got it got it all in in about 30 minutes, so well done. Uh, so yeah, just to wrap it up, we want you to take away from here uh, the reminders about our messaging, our strategies, and how we're going to convey the potential hazards that are coming up and uh, that seasonal outlook of uh, especially what Robin said about one storm doesn't make a season. Uh, there's going to be variations. We're going to have uh, those swings of some very active weather and some very quiet weather. So just keep that in mind as we go into the season and always uh, keep on reaching out to the weather service and, and staying in touch. Uh, this last slide that I have up there, a few reminders. We will send out uh, the slides by the end of the week. Um, we'll send all of this information out to you in a PDF format. So for those that uh, registered, we'll send that out. Uh, I do have a follow-up survey. It's just four questions. Just rate our presentations, how we did, because again, we want to learn how to improve this for next time. Um, so that would be really helpful if you just take a few minutes and uh, give us some feedback on this, these presentations. The contact information I have there uh, is, of course, the Weather Service uh, Spokane email and phone number, 24-7 phone number that's available for you. Ron Miller is our meteorologist in charge, and he graciously took on some night shifts this week so that we could uh, present this to you. So if you ever have any feedback that you want to go all the way up to the top, don't hesitate to reach out to Ron. I'm sure he'd be really happy to hear from you. Um, there's my contact information, and then Robin and Charlotte's 
thank you both Rob. Thank you to both Robin and Char for doing such a great job today. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was I had an incorrect e uh, web address earlier when I was talking about NWS chat. It said nwschat.noaa.gov. I realize now it's actually nwschat.weather.gov is how you sign up. So I will correct that in the slides that we send out. Uh, but if you went to that and tried to log in and it gave you an error, that is why. The correct address is nwschat.weather.gov. And also uh, signing up for the chat rooms once you get in there. Uh, there's over 100, maybe 200 different chat rooms because it's a national uh, page. And so you have to find the one that says Spokane. And I believe it, it's actually under OTX, which is our three letter identifier for this office, OTX chat room. And then in parentheses, it says Spokane. So look for that. And if you can't find it, don't hesitate to reach out to any of us, uh, these emails that I have there. I am looking through the questions and I don't see anything else. Uh, if you want to either raise your hand or uh, send a message in the chat room, I can address that. Um, and we'll stick around for a few more minutes. Otherwise, thank you so much. We had over 60 people join us. Thank you so much for the questions and the feedback and uh, all your attention this morning. Thank you so much. And let me look for questions. seeing any. Thank you, Christina, and thank you, Mike, Michael, and Mike. The follow-up survey will be going out uh, shortly after this is done. Thank you, Simone. Thanks, Jay and Ray. <laughs> it's become a thank you fest. Thanks, Jason. All right, I don't see any hands up and no other questions are coming in. So I'm gonna end this here shortly. Again, you have our email address. If there's anything else that you didn't wanna bring up online, don't hesitate to reach out to any of us. We are here for you and uh, look forward to chatting with you. Otherwise, have a great day, have a great season, and we'll talk to you next time. <laughs>